All right, everybody, welcome back to the Get It Done podcast. My name is Joe Zanke, your host, co-founder and COO of On Demand Storage. And today I'm with Dr. Terry Bader of White Lily Coaching. Terry, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. I appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, I know we had just kind of connected recently at a networking event, which the whole purpose of me starting this podcast was that, you know, I wasn't able to network as much as I once was with COVID. So I wanted to keep in touch with, you know, my former colleagues and, and make new relationships some way. So, but we were able to meet on, you know, a more formalized kind of networking group. And I thought what you did was really interesting. So I wanted to have you on and, um, and talk. So if you could, would you tell us a little bit about White Lily and, and, and your experience running that company? Sure. Yep. So uh, I guess White Lily has been around for, oh, I, I don't know. I stopped counting around 12 years. <laughs> um, and um, we specialize really in, or I specialize. Uh, it's mostly solopreneur, but I mean, I do have uh, part-time colleagues uh, and I do participate in group projects and things like that. Um, so mostly what we do is look at how you're thinking about things. Sure. And um, one of the things I, th I say a lot is you can't scale your company if you can't scale yourself. You know, if you're stuck in the in the weeds, um, you're not going to get anywhere. Right. Oh, yeah. And um, and that goes also for heads of department or that goes for uh, sales representatives uh, in pharma or it doesn't really matter if you're trying to grow. You've got to grow yourself. And most of that is understanding what got you here won't get you there. Mm -hmm. And that you need to change what you're not just what you're doing, but you need to change at a deeper level, kind of on an inner journey, who you're being, why you're doing it, um, what's working, what's not working for you. Um, and I, I really talk a lot about getting out of your left brain into your right mind, understanding where's your ROI as a human being. Not just in your business. If you understand where your ROI is as a human being, you will be much more successful at any activity that you uh, that you undertake. Does that I make sense? Like a, yeah, no, it makes it makes perfect sense. I mean, what you're talking about with scaling, I've seen it firsthand. You know what I mean? If you are, a lot of people go out and start a business, and they are their business. So it's like, you know, you might start like a marketing company or, a, you know, a small social media type company and, and you get some clients and you have some success, but the company isn't really a company. It's just you and the people who are working with, you know, they can get CEO, they can get SEO and, and um, social media from plenty of other places, but they are working with you, not your company. So when you start it that way, it's tough to, to expand because you, you'll reach a certain point where, um, you just can't scale your time anymore. And then it goes into what you were saying about, you know, how to spend time efficiently and effectively. And, and that's where, um, you know, having an understanding of, you know, like you said, getting an ROI, like a lot of people might think, you know, working 15 hours a day is, is the best ROI they're going to get. Whereas, you know, setting up your schedule so that you can take some time off and enjoy things that you like to do outside of work inevitably will lead to more success probably because you're, you know, you're taking some time away from just sitting behind a computer or doing whatever it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, there's a mind shift. There's a paradigm shift that happens. If you want to go from just management to leadership, there is a mind shift that happens. And you have to walk through that fire. And that is understanding that things like effectiveness will be your highest efficiency. Sure. To understand that um, you, what you're doing and how you're doing it are interconnected. It's not just get stuff done. Right. I know we all like to get stuff done. <laughs> yeah, that's the name of the show. <laughs> I know. That's why I'm playing with it, right? We yeah. all want to get stuff done, but which stuff? Yeah, it could be anything. Why, why that stuff over some other stuff? What's the most important stuff that's going to give you more stuff at the outcome? Mm. Mm. And so understanding 
you know, and it comes back to people like Simon Sinek and all of that in that, you know, what's your why? You know, that's his way of, of doing it. What's your why? What do you, you know, what's important for you? And, you know, we talk about passion, like you got to be passionate. And most of us are passionate about something for about five minutes, mm. you know, because it's fun and it's new and it's a novelty. And then we go three steps into it and we find out, oh, there are hurdles. Oh, darn it. You know, it's not easy. So then we go, oh, we pivot and then we take, oh, I'm excited about this new other thing for about five minutes until it comes to a hurdle again. Right. So, so understanding that that passion part, that drive, that comes from who you are. That comes from what I call like the jewel in the wound. Gotcha. You know, some of the, like, I know, for example, this chiropractor, he's the best, amazing chiropractor. Why? Because as a child, he had terrible back problems. And he's like, okay, I'm going to devote my life to fixing this. I'm going to have, I'm going to present solutions to people because I know what it feels like. Yep. His passion comes from who he is, from his story, from his own pain. Mm -hmm. And he's doing it, not just, he's not skimming across the surface because this is a job. It was directly a calling for him. And then, then it became a job. And, you know, and then he goes through the dailies of, of, you know, of dealing with people and, and, and his accounts and his clients and, and the billing yep. that comes later. Definitely. I mean, starting with why is, um, I think is super important, especially when you're doing a business year, because that is what it's, it's always going to be the fuel that's there to keep moving forward. Um, like you said, you know, people will dive into things and it will seem like a cool idea for five minutes. And then, you know, it's just, if it's not backed by like a real reason, mm -hmm. then you're not going to do it. And, and when I started my company, I mean, I never really had a passion for storage or moving people's stuff, but I had a passion to be an entrepreneur. And I knew that no matter what, I was going to try to make that work. And that was just like what I wanted to do. So it kept me going. You know, it didn't, I didn't really take a plan B you know, state of mind to it. And, um, and now, you know, maybe my why has changed a little bit in some ways, but at the end of the day, you know, having that backing you is, um, is so important. And it could, it's, it's different for everybody a lot of the time. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a part where you know you said like having it backing you. I thought that was really interesting what you just said because there's a couple of things that come to my mind and pop for me. Um, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, your why will evolve. It always does. You as a human are going to evolve, and therefore what you do in your life is going to evolve. Just like people. People consider that there was this old school thing where, you know, you start by flipping burgers because you have a little job and then you sort of get a career, you specialize, and then you discover your calling. That's not true anymore. No. No. You can mm -hmm. be doing all three of those things all at the same time. Yeah, definitely. It's multivariable. And, and that's why we have to get out of the left brain linear thinking and that, that little checklist thing and be like, no, that's not enough. It's not gonna, it's not gonna lay out in this linear fashion. Maybe it did a generation or two ago. That was a different world. Today, no, forget it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, you don't have, without the, without the calling, you don't have the same kind of backup because you thought, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm still flipping burgers. I'll get to my career later and then I'll have calling. And, and now you don't even stay in the same job for a couple of years. If you're out there in corporate, mm -hmm. you got to keep moving. You got it. Yep. Totally agree. So you yourself are a, a CEO coach. Um, how did you get into that? You know, how did that opportunity present itself and, and um, you know, how did you make that leap? Um, gosh, that's a really good question. Um, first off, I am a very high level thinker mm -hmm. and I'm highly educated. I'm also an all faith minister and I work on things like consciousness and, and, and writing a book on that. And, and so how people function. And, and when I was 21, I started out in a think tank, um, where I, I was, de we were dealing with the function of the unconscious mind and how we could influ influence um, social engineering 
from a um, policy point of view, working uh, behind the scenes for the government. Yep. Uh, and so I like working at a higher level. So that was my attraction. And the other thing is I also, because of my background and my studies and research, I also understand the complexity of the problems that C-suites are dealing with, whether it's a startup, an SME, or working in corporations. It's so complex and it's very behavioral intensive to, for CEOs. You really have to understand people. Right. Understanding Excel sheets isn't that hard. No, no, you can you can get a hold of that pretty quickly. Right? Yep. Yeah. You know, it's not that difficult. Understanding people, what they're thinking, uh, what what their awareness is, being able to make judgment calls, being able to make decisions from the heart, also when you you cannot have all the data. All the data is not yet available. You've got to pull the trigger. How do you know if you're doing the right thing? So I help them develop the inner knowing. And so that's how I ended up with CEOs. Because gotcha. the, Definitely. Yeah, their, their problem set and my unique ability to help with that problem set. Yep, yep. A good yes. match. No, definitely the qualifications and then, you know, ability combined um, definitely make you a great fit for what you're doing for sure. Um, so what are some of the challenges that these CEOs come to you to solve? I mean, what are some of the, maybe the most common ones that, that you typically see, you know, I'm sure more often than not, they get into doing a business and then that's when your relationship starts rather than vice versa. So yeah. what do they come to you with? Um, there's a couple of things. Um, now, it's interesting you said that because it's not always that in that order. Um, I do have executives come to me who want to become CEOs of their own kind. Yep. And they want to step out of uh, maybe their corporate role and start a company. Yep. That so that's makes sense. A, that's a common thing, uh, which is kind of how I got the name CEO Whisperer. Um, and then, so... A lot of the C C suites, because I do, I have a tendency to attract a lot of CTOs, which is really interesting. I'm trying to like understand that trend right now, and I don't know if it's just because I'm in Boston or that's the deal, or like it's just because tech is booming, or I have some connections to that. I don't know, but um, uh, they're bombarded with data, right? And again, that goes back to the left brain thing. You know, you can. There's only so much of the weeds of all of the aggregated information that your brain can handle, there comes a point where you have to know. You have to know from the inside out what judgment call you're going to make. Mm -hmm. What's going to lead the corporation or lead the um, company forward. Mm -hmm. So how do you know? That is the number one problem that CEOs come to me for is how to know because there's a there's a constant cycle of of not enough information to actually be able to calculate uh what the outcome will be that we want or setting up plans that don't don't unfold so let's say like you know, there's a part where you learn all of the techniques, you have all the tools, and you're a great manager, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's a paradigm shift that comes if you want to be a really great, good or good leader. Mm -hmm. And that means you have to get into your right mind, you have to get into your heart space, into your inner knowing. It means things like intuitive intelligence, Who's going to teach you intuitive intelligence? Where are you going to find that? You kind of got to find it within yourself, like, which is, I feel like what you, because it's in there a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and I do feel like the CEO, the CTO thing is, is interesting because, you know, they're very data driven, like you said, people who, um, you know, are, are oftentimes probably very smart as well. You know what I mean? Very intelligent, you know, high level thinkers, yep. but 
when it comes to having to make decisions, a lot of it is pretty much just backed by data. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, this is right or this is wrong. Um, and they're yeah, coming to you too. Out. Yeah. Yeah. So it's backed by data. It doesn't work out. And that's when they're like, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah. I, I thought this was my whole life was, was making decisions based on this stuff. Yeah. And then find out that doesn't correlate with real life. It, yeah, it? no. And the best C CEOs you see, you know, some of the most famous ones, I feel like have very strong guts. You know what I mean? Like they, when it comes to like, they trust their instincts, their instincts are in check. Um, yes. You know, their gut, you know, leads them in the right direction, gut plus data, but they're good at an analyzing it and making decisions based on that stuff. Whereas a lot of us might have one or the other, you know what I mean? It's yeah. not like, we're not very analytical and you'll make a mistake based, you'll trust your gut fully but you're exactly. not looking at what could be behind that info. Exactly. So, yeah. oh, it's really interesting. And I, I, I could see it being, I mean, even in my own life, you know, sometimes yeah. I'm more of a just trust your gut person and I need someone, you know, behind me to be like, okay, well, let's take a sec, step back here and see like, right. if we were to play this out, is there data showing that like, it's probably not gonna work. And yeah. I'm lucky I have a team, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a, not a solopreneur. I have a couple partners. So we kind of complement each other in that regard. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's in also like the, there's also when you want to be a really good leader, you need to be willing to constantly learn and find out. Like you talk, you know, like if you, 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 you have to compare, like you said, that, that gut feeling, you can have the gut feeling. Now that gut feeling might be, no, I don't want to do that. And that might just be basic fear. Sure. Right. Yep. And then if you work it out on the data, you might be able to, to, to figure out like, okay, so what is this fear? Cause the data says this and my gut says this. So is it that I'm just afraid and I'm not willing to look at the data or is there something missing in the data? Is there something we need to explore that, cause I'm getting this spark of something that feels like it's unknown that needs to be known. So it's this, it's this very complex uh, game of, of understanding, you know, inner and outer circumstances, our own operating system and the operating system of the world and how they correlate or don't Yep. And that's what I work on with people is getting that smooth, take out all of the bugs mm -hmm. that are getting in the way. And we all have them. We have shadow beliefs that we've accumulated. We have uh, social constructs that we obey unconsciously. We have unconscious bias, uh, even towards our own ability. We have unconscious bias. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, we have all these imposter syndrome. Um, so I teach emotional intelligence and all that as well, because mm -hmm. that's, that's really a big part of the picture. I love what I do. And it's, I get to work with the most amazing people. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. All the time, you know, and out of those people, you know, obviously, you know, you don't want to, we don't need to go through names or anything like that, but I'm sure you see people who um, have achieved tremendous levels of success and would be considered, you know, the best. And then there's a, another group of people who are tremendous people, but they're, you know, so what are some traits that you see some of the top performing CEOs or people that you work with? What are a couple of traits that they might have that maybe the rest um, don't quite, haven't developed yet or, or just maybe don't naturally have it, if, if that make, if that question makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. So obviously humility is a superpower. Yep. Humility is a superpower because it keeps you open to learning. People or leaders or managers or, or whatever, anybody who thinks they know is done for. <laughs> I agree. If yeah. you know, there's no room for improvement. There's no room to grow. There's no room to learn something else. Right. If you know, you're done for. Mm -hmm. So the humility of not knowing is really important. Another thing is respect the leaders that i work for all you know or work with they all have a big big value of respect sure 
they they respect uh, other people, they respect other opinions. It doesn't mean they kowtow to anybody. It just means that they are respectful of themselves, of others, and it's that it's it's there's this openness with the humility and the respect that is really uh, an amazing sweet sweet spot that I have found as it's generally what I call my entry point into transformation with my clients. Yep. Yep. Once you have those two things, almost anything is possible. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It really mm -hmm. does when you combine those two things. Those things, I mean, humility, I think, is is definitely the key. It is a superpower and being able to and, and that's what makes the again, the best CEOs are people who recognize that they might not be they're not the best at everything. You know what I mean? So we have like, there are plenty of parts of my business that I, I there are, we have better people in place than I would be at that job. And, and, and there's a reason for it. You know what I mean? Because I can't do everything and I'm not going to say, you know, Hey, I would be the best um, bookkeeper here. You know, I'm, I'm going to be the one that, that, that handles all the finances. No, that's, that's not where my, cause what it ends up doing is not only does it help you build a team that is great, but it inevitably leads to back to your original point of you're doing now your highest ROI activity yes. more often because you're not right. thinking about the other stuff that you have agreed with yourself that you're not the best person for. Right. Because now any, and I said this actually just this week to someone who was a, who was a CTO. Um, your job is not to be the best technical person in the company. Right. Which is like when you're CTO, you think that's your job. No, your job is to lead all of the best technical people in the company. Right. Yeah. 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 Yep. To, to and so and that and that's why I think I'm I think like that's kind of why I'm I'm attracting the CTOs. It's because the, there's that pressure point for them. They need to they need to be able to you know they come out with you know, double PhDs, MIT or whatever. And, you know, inc like inventing incredible new uh, forms of code, like things we've never even heard of before. Yep. And then, um, but that's not enough, which is like a big mystery. Like, how can that not be enough? Like you're super successful. You're, you, you're so good at what you do. You're such an expert. How can that not be enough? Yeah. Well, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. There's the paradigm shift to, okay, you have to, uh, you have to transfer that intelligence to your team and you need your team to be the best technical people around. Yep. And you're the, you're the best leader of technical people around. For and sure. that whole thing is like, oh, wow. Because it's a muscle they haven't used for a long time. Yeah, no, I mean, because that's not where they put their energy. No, exactly, exactly. They developed other parts of themselves, rightly so, as it was asked of them. So they have to flip it, and it's a whole new journey, and that requires a really um, safe, professional space to do that. Understood. No, yeah, I mean, um, I, I could see how that journey, you know, has to transform for sure. And I think that um, you're spot on where, yeah, it goes from being data driven all the time to then opening their mind to, okay, now you don't need to be the best data analyst. You just need to be able to lead them to make the company, the, the, the right decisions for the company and put it in its best spot. Makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. So speaking of technology and staying on that um, topic, you yeah. know, how is technology, have you seen, you know, it disrupting the coaching industry at all? Or have you, been able to take advantages of some of like unique technology that people are using now, like maybe Zoom, where it allows you to, you know, work with people who don't necessarily need to be geographically close to you. I think the coaching industry was already there. Sure. Um, so let's say like in 2020, I, um, I upgraded my, um, my credentials and went through some training and all of that. And everything was on Zoom and everything was absolutely international. Wow. So my cohort, there was people from Canada, Italy, uh, Sweden, uh, New Jersey, Washington, you know, so that was already there and we were already all on Zoom. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, in my practice, was, uh, was also receiving people in person in my home because they wanted it that way. Right. So that forced a shift for some of my clients to, to work remotely. But I was already working with uh, Mexico, Honduras, oh, wow. Italy, um, France. I've got um, uh, Thailand, Philippines. <laughs> So, I mean, I was I'm already there, the UK, um, already there. It's already yeah. happening. Um, obviously other states in the United States as well. So I think that it's going to simply add to this ability to find someone who is a great match for you as a coach and you don't have to stick to this. So for example, I lived in Europe for 20 years. So when I work with Europeans, especially French and UK, we have a lot in common. Right. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of formative years in the UK and a lot of formative years in France. So we share things. And uh, so this is, this is, I think, kind of a new, new normal. Mm. It's good. There's, there's, Good things and bad things about it. Yeah, you know? Yep. Yep. But it is very cool um, in the sense that, you know, because traditionally, you know, prior to this type of technology, it would just be, you know, you'd be limited to where you can drive on any given day or where your clients can drive to you. Um, but now it's like you can work with anybody, you know, across all the different, especially that's very cool that you have some ties to the, the UK and France and, and, and yeah. continue, well, even though you might be in America could continue to do business over there and, and, and maintain relationships, you know, on a professional level. Yeah. And I think it's, what's happening is there's a mind shift that, well, this is the way we do it now because a lot of people prior to this would have said to me, Oh no, I like, I prefer to be in person and you know, so I'm going to find somebody who's more close to me. Yep. Uh, instead of looking at someone who's more close in mind and heart or experience or expertise, they're looking for this locality thing so that they can physically meet in person. But since that's no longer available, I do it well, I might as well just get the person who fits me best. I, my physical therapist now is no longer in my locality. She's, uh, she's in um, Oregon. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's amazing. It's like I had to go on Zoom anyway. Yes. I found, I, I just went, okay, so I'm going to find the absolute best person that I can talk to. She's going to understand everything I say. And if I talk to her about meridians or prana or whatever, she's going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. And she's going to understand, you know, what I'm, the kinds of things I do for my body. That's awesome. I and mean, that makes perfect sense too. Why not? You got to do it that way anyways. So it's like, you know, go after the person that, the best. oh yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's really interesting. So how are people finding you? You know I mean? You got the, the CEO whisperer title, I'm sure carries a good amount of weight, which, uh, but you now at the end of the day, I mean, um, how are people, how are you attracting, you know, new CEOs and, and, and what's working for you when it comes to, um, growing your business that way? Um, I'm still very much on a referral basis um, because I have not chosen, I have chosen to not make a system, but rather be the coach that adapts to the client. Um, I'm still on a referral. So I tend to have a full roster because of, you know, people talking to people. Mm -hmm. Um, I do do a little bit of online work. Now I, I do, I have, I'm on Instagram. Um, I have a website. I'm uh, beefing a lot of that stuff up because I, I don't know how things might shift. And sure. just like I found my PT, I was like, oh, well, maybe I should be more present as the best for this particular thing. Mm -hmm. And so I am beefing that up a little bit. But thus far, I have to say, it's really just polishing my aura. It's not, and it's just getting my, getting my presence out there. I'm not that aware 
actually, no, that's not 100% true because I've solidified my network with, with real people through Twitter, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and all of that. And so I did actually have someone bring me a client through Instagram. Yep. Yeah, I, I just realized that. So by being on Instagram, it did actually bring me something. It did, it opened that door for that person to say, hey, somebody I know needs a coach. You're the best one I know. Here, talk to this person. That's so it's kind of like a, a new layer to the referral. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. That's, so, that's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, referrals is the best way to get business, obviously, at the end of the day. It's, 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 if you can establish a good referral network, then like you said, you're going to stay busy. You're going to keep a full roster and the people that are working with you, you know, you have to go out and make sales. Like they're coming to you for a reason. So they already, you know, have been someone else already sold for you, you know, which is great. <laughs> but yeah, no, I do think there's a lot of cool ways out there. Like you said to, you know, we built a lot of our business off of um, being present online and, um, and growing, you know, playing with different strategies when it comes to SEO, uh, people finding us with yes. keywords, I think has been super important. Um, and email marketing has been great. You know what I mean? Even though that like changes all the time when it comes to spam filters, um, mm -hmm. it's still super powerful if you get good at it, to, if you, getting your message out there, at least to a wide audience. But um, no, different things work for different people. And you know, I think that at the end of the day, any business's goal would be to get a lot of their clients from referrals. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. I, it's, uh, but then also it's the kind of business I am in uh, doesn't require a long roster of clients. Sure. You know, if I've got 20 clients, you're busy. Um, yeah, because you have to remember I'm right. I'm, I'm writing, publishing a book. I'm doing my own podcast. Oh yeah. So my podcast is, um, here's a plug, right? Nice. Plug it in. Plug it in. Uh, Paradise Podcast, um, Paradise Reclaimed Podcast. Sorry. I Paradise Reclaimed. So what I'm working on there is helping people who can't be my client because that's expensive, right? right? Yep. And so, but what I teach CEOs is good for everybody. Mm in all levels of life. If you, you know, that whole paradigm shift of understanding yourself and growing your emotional intelligence or whatever that might be works for everybody. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. that's paradise reclaimed is basically taking back your own personal power and understanding how you work, how the world works and, and how you can have the successes and the gains that you want in your life in the same way that, you know, I, I would educate a professional. I like it a lot. Yeah. I'm going to have to check that out. So that sounds yeah, great. I hope you do. And you'll so, tell me what works and what doesn't work for you. I will. I will. I, uh, no, I need, I need some more new podcasts and that one sounds like a good one to, uh, to, to just educate myself on different things. Um, so the last question I like to ask my guests, I uh, ask everybody, I'm trying to build out a, a library at some point in my life. What's a good book recommendation that you would give the audience? Uh, it doesn't have to be business related. It could be something that you've read recently or anything you want. There's a lot. There is a lot written in my, in my field. Um, I like Cycle Cybernetics, um, Maxwell Malt. Uh, I was Malt, so I was messed up his name. Um, I do like Simon Sinek and Brene Brown, everything they've written. Um, I do also like the four agreements by Reese. Um, what else is there? I mean, there are things like thinking fast and slow. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's Kaufman or Kaufman or whatever. I was just, I just started reading that the other day. Um, but a lot of that stuff is really super intellectual. Right. Yeah. 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 I don't, I don't feel like it. I, so I don't feel like it gives a lot of power to the individual it's like it pulls you into something that's very educational mm -hmm. but i don't feel like it's like mm, 
you know? Like, yeah, um, you're not going to read it and go out and, you know, change your whole world from, you're going to pick up probably a lot of really good knowledge if you right. do it the right way, but mm -hmm. now, like the probably not very applicable all the time for everybody. Right, but something like the four agreements makes you pop. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like so little, this little book. Yep. Kind of fun to read, so it yep. keeps you going. Yeah. And then you're like, the fir first, don't take it personally. First agreement, like, oh, well, yeah, I guess we kind of do do that, don't we? So all the time. Stop. If you stop taking it personally, whew, you know, it like takes a load off. You can think again. Yeah. Absolutely. There are like all these, I like those kind of books. That one sounds like a great one. Then that's, um, yeah, I'll definitely take a look into everything. But you normally, I, I end these things that go on Amazon and end up. Yeah. buying a book or something so uh, yeah like i said trying to build up the library i think that would be a fun thing to have um especially around the office you know being able to offer it to the employees if they want to pick a book and read and i yeah. encourage that type of stuff uh, well this has been awesome terry thank you very much for coming on and joining me um i appreciate all the info that you've given into the you know your profession and and how people think and how you you know work and coach them through um some of life's challenges and, um, and I'll definitely take you up on, you know, taking a look at that podcast for sure. Please do. I want, I want all the feedback. <laughs> Paradise Reclaimed podcast. And where can people find you? You mentioned, you know, a couple of different places. Well, we have the website. So yep. Paradise Reclaimed podcast.com. Yep. We have, um, we're on Apple, we're on Spotify, we're on Google, we're on Deezer. We're pretty much everywhere. <laughs> so if you can, if you can, uh, you know, Remember, Paradise Reclaimed, it's sort of like getting back your own little Garden of Eden for yourself. I like that. Um, and taking back your personal power. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, that sounds awesome. Well, thank you again, Terry. This has been great. Thank you, Joe. You've been Take great. Care. This has been awesome. <laughs> Appreciate it. Take care.